Hey guys, so I've been having some weird issues with my original Xbox. It's been doing some weird things like powering on by itself, the disk drive has been opening by itself, which is pretty weird because the eject button doesn't work. But I'm gonna see if I can try to fix this today. But before I do, let me go ahead and show you what's going on. All right, I got the Xbox here and I'm just gonna power it on. You can see the disk drive is already starting to act up. You can also see that there's no LED present on the eject button, which makes sense considering the button itself isn't working either. Yeah, see what I mean? So we're gonna have to disassemble the Xbox and take a look at what's going on. I did look up online the issues that I was having on top of jumping into some pretty cool console repair communities that I found on Reddit and Facebook and so on. But the general consensus that I got was that it's most likely a leaky capacitor, which tends to go bad in these consoles. So I hope that's not the case, but let's go ahead and find out. All right, so the first thing we're going to do here is flip the console over. So you can see here the console's never been opened. The stickers are actually all still intact, which is a shame because we're going to have to peel some of these areas to get screws out from underneath the stickers. Uh, there's six of them that we're going to have to take out. There's one underneath each foot here, and we're going to have to peel the rubber back to get to those. And then once again, there's some underneath these stickers. Now, another thing I want to make note of before we continue on is this Microsoft Corporation sticker right here with our manufacturing date on it. This is just a guess, but by going off of this date, I can assume that I have a version 1.0 or a version 1.1 board. Considering this is a little later in the year, I'm going to assume 1.1 at this time. So for those of you who haven't disassembled an Xbox console yet, you're going to need some Torx screwdrivers. I believe you're just going to need the T20 and the T10, but I have a whole set. Now, what I'm going to do here is use an X-Acto knife and peel up on the feet here. That way I can get to the screws. So let me go ahead and just jump into that. And once it's exposed, we can go ahead and take the screwdriver and start taking them out. And we're going to repeat the process with all four of these. And now we're going to take out the two that are underneath the stickers. You can just kind of feel around with your finger where they're at. And this one's right here. So I'm just going to go ahead and poke it with the screwdriver. And then take it out. And then the same exact thing for the other one. And with those screws out, you should just be able to flip the Xbox back over and slide the top half of the case right off. So to start things off, you can see we have the ribbon cable here that's tucked underneath a clip. We can go ahead and just move that out. And now we can go ahead and remove one end from the back of the hard drive. There's a lot of disassembly videos on the original Xbox, so I'm just going to speed through this a little bit. The next thing we're going to do is remove the power connector from the hard drive. I like to use a pair of needle nose pliers for this because it's kind of hard for me to get my fingers in there, but it should come out pretty easily. Next up, we have just one screw holding the housing for the hard drive into place, so I'm just going to remove that. Now, in order to actually remove this, we have to take the cables out of the track here on the right side. Just take your time. It's pretty easy. Just kind of maneuver through all of that, and then the whole housing should just come out. There we go. Okay, next up will be the disk drive. There's only two screws holding this in the place. The one on the right that you're seeing here. And then the one directly to the left in the same spot. After those are removed, the disk drive should just lift right out. You'll still have those cables connected though, so don't tear it out too fast. Now on the back, it's just like the hard drive. We just have two things that we need to unplug. And once that's done, we can place the disk drive off to the side. And before we continue on, I just want to stop here and show you guys how dusty this is on the inside. I'm going to have to clean this up a little bit before I put this back together. But really, it's not that bad considering the fact the console hasn't been open for over 20 years. So next up, we're just going to remove the IDE cable from the board. And then we're going to do the same thing with the power cord. So now the next thing is to remove the Xbox power supply. We have a single row power connector here that we just have to pull out. It's in there pretty good, but just Try to be gentle but firm if that's the best way I can describe it. Now there's also two screws that we have to remove from here. There's one at the top that you can see me removing right now. 
And then one more right at the bottom. I don't have a good camera angle of this one, but it's right underneath the uh, power cord here. After the screws are out, this should be free to slide back and then we can just pull it out of place. Moving on, we're gonna take out the fan back here, which is a little bit of a pain. We'll start by disconnecting it from the power. I'm gonna need some pliers again here because of the sausage fingers. Now, as far as taking it out goes, there's two tabs, one on the left and one on the right. I have a little pry tool that I use here. You could probably use a flathead screwdriver, but uh, I kind of loosen one side, hold one end up, and then work on the other side until it pops out. After you get that initial pop, you just have to work it out of the tracks and then it should come right out. Now we have to remove these three connections that are in the front of the console. All right, and the last step is to unscrew the motherboard from the case, so let me speed run through that. Now, removing the motherboard from the case can be a little tricky in my opinion. You kind of got to lift up the front half of the case first and then work those ports out through the back and just try not to damage anything. But we finally have it out and now we can get a good look at what's going on here. So one thing I want to point out is that I have a Konzant video chip. Earlier I thought I could have had a version 1.1 console, but this chip means I have a version 1.0. I also have a fan on top of the GPU heatsink and a single row power connector, and that's also a telltale sign of a version 1.0. And if I look to the left, I actually have a sticker on it that says kernel 4034. And if we look that up, that also confirms that we have a version 1.0 board. So that's pretty neat. Okay, so now let's take a look at this clock capacitor. This guy right here is the usual culprit for a leaky capacitor. I mean, all of them can really do that, but this is the one that usually does it. It doesn't look like it's swelling though, and overall doesn't look too bad, but I'm gonna get another angle to take a look. So taking a look at this from a different angle, you can kind of see at the bottom here, we definitely have something leaking here. Another thing I noticed was that if I lightly touch the capacitor, it actually moves very easily. Now, uh, removing the capacitor is no new thing. A lot of people just pull these things out. It's not really the recommended thing to do, but I mean, it would work. I'm gonna do it a little cleaner and I'm gonna take the soldering iron to this and actually remove this the right way. So all we're gonna do to get started in removing this is just flip the motherboard over. I already know the general area of where I'm gonna be, so let me just zoom in on that. And you can see right here, I definitely have some corrosion on these traces here, but I will focus on that in a minute. What I'm gonna do to remove the capacitor though is pull down on the bottom with a pair of tweezers as I hit the top half with the iron. Let me just add a little bit of flux to help the process. And we'll start going at these pads one by one. I did notice here though that one pad was completely easy to get out and the other one I could not remove no matter what I did. I ended up going at this part here for at least 10 minutes trying to get it out easily. And finally, after a lot of struggling, I did manage to remove it. And you can see just looking at the bottom of this thing, well, let me zoom in so you guys get a nice clear shot. This thing is definitely leaking at the bottom. You can see one pin did not come out. Looks like that got stuck in the board. And uh, I'm gonna see if I can get a close up of it, but I'm gonna show you guys the board. That whole pad is actually just so corroded. It explains why I had such a tough time trying to get it out. And for what it's worth, I did go back in there and remove that one leg that was stuck in there. But now that the culprit is removed, I just want to show you the other side where it came from. And you can literally see how corroded this thing is. So I'm going to take some rubbing alcohol and a Q-tip and start cleaning around some of these areas. And actually for this area specifically, I'm just going to waterfall some rubbing alcohol right onto there and let it soak for a second. And you can see just putting the Q-tip on here, everything started moving like off rip. It's already changing the color of the Q-tip. So this will be fun to clean up. And skipping ahead, you can see I got the area all nice and cleaned up. But now we can finally move on to the real issues here. All the corrosion damage that was done because of this clock capacitor chip. And just a brief explanation, the clock capacitor chip that we remove is used only to keep the clock on the Xbox. And that's only if you remove like the power from the wall. Other than that, it'll always keep the time. Uh, other than that, there's really no need for that capacitor. You have to change them often and they tend to leak and ruin the board. So I believe for uh, revisions 1.0 to 1.5, it's recommended to remove and leave out. And for revision 1.6, it's better to replace. So for this, I'm not going to replace it. 
And because I know my camera won't be able to pick up all the small things I'm about to show you, I actually bought a microscope and I'm really excited to try it out. So let's see how this works. So this one's more of the zoomed out view first here. You can see we removed the clock capacitor chip over here on the right. But on the left, all of these traces really look terrible. I'm gonna show you a zoomed in version in a second, but uh, these all lead power from all sorts of different places. And I'm assuming this is why I'm having all the issues that I'm having. And even if you go down, there's separate traces here next to the uh, R3V2 and R3V3. And if you follow these traces, there's also corrosion on them as well. I went ahead and counted and I found over nine traces that were bad. Well, let me give you the zoomed in version of it. So these are the traces that are right next to the clock capacitor. And if you really look at them, they're all a mess. All of them look kind of broken. I took a multimeter to them earlier to see if they were drawing power from one end to the other and they were not having any continuity. So these are definitely all broken. So now just to give you a description of what we're gonna be doing here, I'm gonna start off working on the bottom pads here that say R3V1 all the way through R3V4. These four traces are all bad. So I'm literally gonna start from point A of the trace and work my way to point B. We're gonna find that spot that has corrosion and we're gonna use a 30 gauge Kynar wire to jump the connection from one good spot to the next good spot. That way we can just bypass all the bad stuff. I already cleaned the area with rubbing alcohol. All that's left to do is just start soldering all this stuff. And honestly, the components on this are really tiny, so I don't recommend you trying this if you're brand new to soldering. If you're looking for a more in-depth tutorial on how to do this, the channel Sagaholic does a really good job at explaining all this, and it's actually where I learned most of my information to attempt this at home. So I highly recommend his content. Now, one thing before we start, Flux is going to be your best friend in this. I, I would not even attempt this if you don't have any Flux. It's really going to help speed up the process, make things flow easier, and if you get this job done a lot quicker. So another thing I did to make this easier was tin the end of the Kynar wire. When I'm soldering onto these very small pins, I try my best to angle the tip of the wire away from any traces or any other wires that may be in the area because I don't want to cross any connections. You can see this wire here tacked in pretty easily. Let's go ahead and do the other side. And we're just going to tack it in. You can see that I'm angling it away from the other traces. And once again, we're going to have to clean up everything when we're all done here. But I'm going to do the same exact process for all the rest of the red wires. I did color code the two sections that I need. So the red wires are going to be the four traces that are bad here. And then I have another five bad traces that I'm going to use a blue wire for. So let me go ahead and jump through the red. And here we go. I got our four connections here. Let me just zoom in so you guys can see to the best of my ability here. And now let me jump ahead to the blue wires being done. So the blue wires were actually a lot easier to do in comparison to the red ones. I actually had bigger pads to solder onto, which made the process a lot easier. But you can see I did four here along these traces that rode to these points. And I'll try to have future Jeremy leave diagrams if he can. And then one more slightly to the left. This one's a little longer, but it goes all the way from this pad all the way to this pad. But now, once the wiring's all done, the next thing that we can do is use a multimeter to make sure all of our connections have continuity. So just give me one second and I'll show you guys what I mean. So I have my multimeter set to beep when it checks for continuity. And all we're going to do is just check the points from point A to point B and see what happens. And that's a good sign. That means this one is clear. And I'm just going to do this with the other eight. So it looks like everything checks out with the multimeter. The last thing that I'm going to do is just clean up the area with some thermal tape. I tried using hot glue in the past and honestly it just made things look ugly and I know my wiring is not the best already so I'm going to do the best that I can with some tape just to kind of keep things seated and stop things from falling apart when I put the case back together and just overly make things a little neater. So here's what I ended up doing with the thermal tape and honestly as long as it sticks and I have functionality to console I'm fine with it. This is an old shot. You can see right here, I actually have a piece of tape on the RAM chip. I'm not gonna leave that there. I actually got worried about insulation issues uh, like a quarter away through setting this up. So I have moved this piece of tape all the way to the right onto those traces. But other than that, we can start assembling the board. All right, so I placed the motherboard back inside of the case. You have to be very careful when doing this because it's got those grooves that are underneath that you don't want to hook the wires and pull out of place. So just be careful when you're putting that in. I also added the fan back into place, which was super simple. It was just pop in and then plug back in. But once you have everything seated in properly, we can start screwing back in the board to the case. 
After that's done, it's really just backtracking. We have those three connections that we removed prior that we're just going to plug back in. And then I'm going to slide the power supply back in. And then we're going to secure it in with those two screws from earlier. Then we're going to plug back in that power connector to the DVD drive as well as the IDE cable. And then we're going to connect them into the back of the DVD drive. And then we'll just seat this whole housing back into place. And tighten up those two screws holding it in. Next up, the hard drive. And the first thing I'm going to do is connect the power cable. And then the IDE cable for this as well. And now you got to be careful when you're putting this in there because you have to have the wiring honestly sitting in the right angle. So just make sure you do the wiring the same exact way as you took it out from. After that's done, we have the one screw that holds this housing in place and then the clip for the ribbon cable. And now we can pop the top half of the case back on. And now let's flip this over and put these six screws back in. And now the case is all set. So now all we have to do is just test this thing. So let me head over to my monitor. Okay, so everything's set up. Let's go ahead and turn it on. So it boots. That's a good sign. The dish drive hasn't shot open already. That's a good sign. We have an LED on the eject button. That's another good sign. And it looks like it works. I'm going to pop in a disc real fast. Actually, let me test the button too. The button works. That's good. It looks like we fixed it, guys. Let me just pop in a game and double check on that. And I think you know which game I'm going to go with. And we'll just give this a minute for the Xbox to read. We can see DVD initializing. Now it says checking. And we have game, so it works. Let me just hit launch DVD. There it is. Awesome. So this was my first time doing anything this extensive, and I have to say it was pretty difficult. I could definitely do it again. I gained a lot of experience doing this, and I actually had a lot of fun with the whole trial and error process of it. But I don't recommend doing this to beginners. Uh, if you have any trouble or if you have a problem similar to mine, I'll try to help you out in the comments. Uh, again, check out Sagaholic's channel if you have any more issues that I haven't covered here or if you want something covered in more detail over there. But I think I'm going to end the video here on a good note now that the Xbox is working, and I'll see you guys in the next video. See ya.